Times a year. We're going to get started, everybody. <laughs> I'd like to, to welcome you all here. The uh, the talks are, are put on by the the town's historic advisory committee, uh, and we've been doing this now for six or seven years. It seems like. Um, it, thank you all for coming. Um, there's a sign-up sheet in the back. It's, it's not super important that, that you sign it, but if you have not received an email from me reminding you that there's a talk tonight and you'd like to receive one, if you leave your name and your email address, I will try as best I can to get you on the list and you'll receive something. And Ed, you were on the list. I don't know what happened to you, but I'll, I'll, get, I'll get you back on. Uh, we're very fortunate tonight to have um, Michael Kaufman, who's been the manager of Eastview Mall for 28 years. 28? Yeah. It's amazing how more and more things you look back and say i've been doing this for 30 years or i've known that person for for 27 years and it must be it can't be our age but but for whatever reason that that you have that feeling more and more often um and speaking of age eastview mall is this year is celebrating its 50th birthday 50th anniversary so if you remember when that was the a farm lot you've been in Victor longer than I have um, yeah and now you've and now you've got dicks um, so if you haven't signed up and you want a, you want a reminder, get your your name and email address in the back. Uh, the, the next presentation will be um, the first Thursday in December, and it's going to be um, Jason Shelton, uh, who is a longtime Victorite and longtime fireman, and he's going to be talking about the history of the the, the Victor Fire Department. Um, and, and that should be an, an interesting talk. Um, so I'll turn it over to Mike, and um, you know, if you have any questions, you know, afterwards just shout it out, and we'll, we'll learn all about Eastview Mall. Mike, thank you. Thank you, Bob. As Muriel can attest, 28 years ago, I had a lot of brown hair, didn't I, Muriel? Huh? My gosh, those were the days. Uh, thank you all for coming this evening. I really appreciate it. It's uh, very nice of you to come out and uh, um, I'd like to recognize all of our veterans as well. I know there's at least a handful of them here. So uh, I'm not sure you say happy Veterans Day, but I'd like to you know, thank you all for, uh, uh, for what you've done over the years. Uh, I'd like to tell you a little bit about myself. I, don't, I certainly don't like to talk about myself too much, but I will tell you that um, I'm originally from Batavia, New York. Uh, back in 1984, I graduated from college at Geneseo in May of 84. And I was very fortunate in June of 84, I got hired by Wilmerite, a uh, local developer, and uh, have been with them ever since. And I feel very privileged and lucky to have, uh, to have done that. Uh, I, prior to coming to Eastview in 93, during that nine year period between 84 and 93, uh, I managed uh, Grease Town Mall on the other side of town. Uh, I managed a mall that we had in the Syracuse area called Camillus Mall on the west side of Syracuse. 
I managed a, opened and managed a mall called Rotterdam Square, uh, which is in the Schenectady area. And then uh, prior to coming back here to uh, the Rochester area, I was managing a property that we opened up in suburban Chicago. And I was there from 1991 to 1993. So I came back here in 1993 when the plans were announced for the mall expansion. Um, I still call it the expansion, even though it was 26 years ago. Uh, but uh, um, came back and have been there ever since. Uh, live here in the area, and it's been uh, it's been wonderful. Um, as Bob noted, we recently celebrated our 50th anniversary. Uh, in the the back of the room, uh, if you get a chance when you leave, uh, I've got our grand opening flyer from October. Uh, 7th, 1971, and feel free to uh, uh, to browse through that. Uh, I can thank Sue Stelling for that. I used to have a copy, and it disappeared over to our corporate office. And uh, back about a month ago, Sue gave me a call and said, hey, you know what I have that you might be interested in? And uh, she had that flyer. So uh, feel free to, to take a look. And also back there, one of the things that I did have is the flyer from when we opened up in 1973, our, our McCurdy's wing. So uh, take a look at that. Um, and, and you know, when we talk about the history of the mall, uh, if we even go way, way further back than that, there's another uh, article back there that uh, I made a copy of, just or copies of, because I thought it was very interesting. It goes back again, it's a, it was an article that was written in that uh, grand opening flyer and it was written by Sheldon Fisher, and it was a story about the, the history going way back uh, from that property, and you know, the Seneca Trail, and uh, um, the Bone Steel Farm, and so on. I mean, things that I had just heard about, but obviously never experienced, so. Uh, so 50 years, you know, we're, we're, we're thrilled about it. We feel honored, we're, we're appreciative uh, to the entire community for, for all the support they've given us. Uh, you know, I, I took a look, um, and it was more my curiosity. You may not find this interesting at all, but back on October 7th of 1971, the number one song was Maggie Mae by Rod Stewart. And that song has held up pretty well over the years. Uh, the number one movie was The French Connection. It's been a long time since I saw that, so I have no idea if that's held up well over the years. But uh, that was the number one song and the one number one movie back on the day we opened for business. So. Hopefully get this right. As I noted, 50 years in the Victor community. All right, the work begins. <clears throat> you know, the uh, the work actually began uh, with with discussions by our ownership uh, with plans to uh, place the mall or have the mall located in the town of Parenton, about a half a mile to a mile uh, further down on Route 96. Um, plans were moving ahead, as I understand it. And uh, at the town planning board meeting, I believe, or the town board meeting, uh, the project was turned down. And uh, very shortly thereafter, the owner of the, the property that the mall sits on had approached our, our owners, the, the Wilmont brothers, uh, and said they had some property that uh, they might be interested in building the mall on. And uh, that's, that's how uh, Eastview Mall uh, ended up in Victor, New York. The original plan was to be uh, in Parenton, but uh, it did not work out. So, uh, again, thanks to Victor, um, we ended up uh, located in Ontario County in Victor, New York. So the site was chosen back in May of 69, and the construction began in August of 1970. And uh, from my understanding, it was a very, very brutal winter uh, that year. It was very, very difficult construction. Um, but they, they forged through it and met their opening date of uh, October 7th of 1971. Uh, shopping centers, particularly malls, always prefer to open up right around the fourth quarter whenever possible. That gives you an opportunity to, to catch the benefit of the holiday season. Hopefully you open up maybe a, you know, four to six weeks prior to the holiday season kicking in to give the stores the opportunity to uh, kind of break in and, and, and get the kinks out, so to speak. So uh, you normally like to open. I mean, that's pretty much about the perfect time to open a shopping center. And uh, the leases that are signed typically 
uh, run through the end of January. And that's really by the, the tenant design because they want to make sure no matter when they sign that lease and got open, that they get that last holiday season in. So that's why I come, you know, January 31st or February in any mall around the country, that's when you start seeing, you know, maybe a store, stores here and there closing uh, because the lease has expired and either the tenant or the developer decided that maybe they weren't a good fit anymore. So. We open, uh, as noted, October 7th, 1971 was the opening date. Uh, when we opened, we had a great lineup of stores, fashion stores. Uh, we had stores like Chess King, McFarland's, Casual Corner, uh, Foxmore, you know, stores that were really popular uh, at that time. And I think what, what's kind of interesting too is out of the 80 stores that opened, 10 of those were shoe stores, um, which is a very, very high percentage of shoe stores for a mall nowadays. You know, we had, you know, Florsheim, Kinney's, Altiers, Tom McCann, I don't think Endicott Johnson came for a couple of years, uh, but Flag Brothers, um, some of the old shoe store names that, that you may uh, may remember. Nowadays, however, excuse me, back then we did not have sneaker stores. Uh, and over the years, obviously, sneakers have become uh, a very, very big part of that footwear category. So uh, most malls have at least a few sneaker stores in our footwear stores. In fact, our new Dick store, uh, believes that they have the largest sneaker wall either in the country or east of the Mississippi, one or the other. So um, goes to show you how popular it is and how much of a, uh, you know, uh, a draw sneakers are nowadays. So, and uh, of course we have some other really uh, interesting stores, popular stores. Woolworths uh, was one of the stores that people just loved. Uh, when I arrived in 93, Woolworths was still open. Um, and, uh, you know, they had the, if you walked in, they had the kitchen and the restaurant there off to the left. And, and it was a very, very popular store. And a lot of people were unhappy to see them go. Uh, but it just so happened at that point in time, you know, plans were underway for the expansion. And uh, we had signed, Woolworths wanted to leave. I mean, we, you know, th that was by their choice as well. but. We ended up putting a store called FYE in there. If you remember, we had a really big, supersized FYE store. I think they ended up doing about five of them in the country that were that large. Uh, ours was the last to close, but it was a, uh, a really, really good uh, uh, tenant for us, a very popular tenant. They did books, they did you know, records, CDs, pop culture stuff. And uh, you know, I mentioned books, back at that time we had in addition to them, we also had two bookstores. We had B. Dalton Book and we had Walden Book. And nowadays, bookstores, with the exception of Barnes & Noble, um, you really don't find them around too much anymore, except maybe some used bookstores or privately owned bookstores. Um, so, uh, you know, same with music stores. You know, we used to have Discworld and Record Town and Camelot Music, and now, you know, most of those, uh, um, you know, it's done, you know, via Apple or, you know, iPods or, you know, kind of that type of thing. So another store I was just thinking of on the way over here that we had that was uh, always uh, created a few challenges for us, whether it was Dr. Pet Center. Um, they were a pet store located in the front of the mall. Uh, nice owner, a little eccentric. Um, but he really loved his animals and cared about them. And I, I was thinking, I had, I had gotten a call one day from him uh, telling me that uh, he, uh, his white python was missing. And uh, I distinctly remember asking him, you know, you have a white python? And, and, and he said, yeah, he says, and it, it's not in its cage. And, and I'm like, oh my gosh, you know, what am I gonna do? You know, so he, uh, he felt pretty confident. He said, I, I, I'm pretty sure it's still in the store. I said, God, I hope so, you know. Um, so, you know, he, he said, you know, I'm gonna keep on looking, you know, and, and I'll, I'll get back in touch with you. 
And obviously, you know, a lot of scenarios were going through my mind about where this white python was going to end up. And he said, you know, you know, they're not venomous. I said, well, 95% of people have no idea that, that they're not venomous. They're not going to know what kind of a snake it is. They're just going to see a big, ugly, you know, intimidating snake. So there was kind of a sleepless night that night. I'm thinking, oh, my gosh, where is this thing going to end up? And uh, so the following day, John, the owner, gave me a call and, and broke the good news to me that they did find the snake, and it was curled up by a, a heat register, like in the corner of a store. So crisis averted, because it could have turned out a lot worse than it did. So but yeah, we opened up 80 stores, um, you know, including Sears and Sibley's. Sears was just here until a couple of years ago, and obviously Dick's House of Sport has, has just uh, joined them very recently, or joined us very recently. Sibley's a great, uh, you know, family department store that was here for many years. I mean, it was really two very, very solid department stores we had here when we opened up in 1971. Uh, our, our tagline, just around the corner, um, it's funny, that, that tagline has been not part of our, our marketing for since probably the late 80s, maybe early 90s, and that's still the tagline and the theme that people remember most about the mall. People still will sing the, the jingle to me. Uh, we haven't been able to find a jingle that kind of can take over that uh, uh, just around the corner. So uh, a lot of people remember that. Uh, you know, the mall opened up um, and it followed the open of a, a opening of a few other properties here in Rochester. Uh, Midtown Plaza opened up in 1962. Greece Town Mall in 1967, and Long Ridge Mall opened up a little, you know, just a few weeks earlier in 1971. For some reason, I had in my mind that it, they opened up in 1969, but I, I checked a few, uh, few sources, trusted sources, and they opened up pretty close to when uh, we opened up back in 1971. The mall had green carpet, which uh, a lot of people liked. Um, Personally, I, I can tell you operationally, having a carpeted mall and kind of in this type of climate, it was it was very difficult to to keep it clean. Um, smoking was was allowed at the time in the mall, so you know we'd get you know cigarette burns on the carpet, and people'd be walking through the mall, you know, spilling food, and it was just a lot harder to keep clean. And I remember, you know, early on walking through the mall with with my boss. And I was telling him that I just wasn't really keen on the carpet. It, it, you know, it was just, you know, we had some areas that were pretty well worn and, and, uh, and they didn't look that good. And uh, he said, well, he says, I'll, I'll tell you that, that's Uncle Wee's Irish green carpet. You don't want to say too much bad about it. So that was the last time I said anything bad about that carpet. So, and interestingly, and I don't, I don't know if there's any, if it's a, just a pure coincidence, but the mall tile that went in, uh, in the mall, and is in there still currently, has a lot of green in it. So, you know, maybe somebody's still looking down, uh, maybe Uncle Wee's still looking down uh, at that, uh, uh, that flooring every day. And our sign, how uh, you can see our sign, if, if you remember, that said on Route 96, uh, very visible as you're driving by. Um, that picture there was from 1971. Uh, it's being put up by Empire Sign, who I don't think is around anymore under that ownership. I think there might be a, an Empire Digital Sign or something here in town, but uh, um, they're they're putting it up, and and that came down. I was trying to remember when that came down. I think it was sometime in the 90s. The um, that sign ended up coming down, but uh, um, it, it was revived and talk about it a little bit later when we opened up a little bit later. And there is a one store that is still at the mall that has been here since day one, since the mall opened in 71. And uh, you know, we've had a few stores that have kind of come and gone, but one that's been there consistently, a, a few different locations. And it's not a store that I think anyone would have thought back in 1971 that would still be here 50 years later. Does anybody want to take a guess who that is? And I bet you you get it wrong. No, no, not pennies. No, 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 no. Spencer Gifts. Who would? Yeah. <laughs> well, 
You know, who, who would, you know, really, who would have thought the Spencer Gifts would, would still be, you know, in existence? And that, you know, they deserve a tremendous amount of credit for being able to adapt and, and, and stay in business and, and find the right products to sell. Uh, some of those products are, you know, we will get the occasional complaint about, but, uh, but they, you know, they have found a way to, to, to succeed over the last 50 years. So um, a, lot of, uh, a lot of credit goes to them. Uh, about two years later, the McCurdy's Wing opened. Um, smaller expansion, but still an expansion. You know, McCurdy's, of course, was a, a locally owned department store. Uh, they think already probably had two or three locations in the uh, the Rochester area at that time. Uh, opened up with additional 12 stores, uh, including Anderson Little, Scran Scranton, Shears, Endicott, Endicott Johnson Shoes. I think Camelot Music was in that wing. So uh, it was not a big expansion, but it created a, a T, which is, was pretty traditional and is still pre pretty traditional for a shopping mall that, that has three department stores. Um, the, uh, that I believe is the probably the, the grand opening of the wing. Uh, the, uh, some of you may know who those two gentlemen are um, at the podium. I don't. Uh, the gentleman on the left is uh, uh, one of the Wilmont brothers that, uh, uh, that was one of the owners of the property. Um, but, uh, but I am not sure who those other two gentlemen are. But uh, obviously some, some dignitaries from the area who helped us open up back in uh, uh, in 73, you know, made them all a little bit stronger. Um, and, uh, you know, the mall really continued uh, operating kind of in that, with that size and, 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 and look for the next several years. In fact, about 22 more years. The center did well. It was not a uh, tremendously, you know, successful property, but it was a solid property for us. It did well. We were able to keep it uh, pretty well leased during those years. Um, serviced, I think, this this part of the uh, the market very well. But over time, when we got to the early 90s, or uh, well, let's say the 80s, we had marketplace open up in the early 80s. Uh, we ended up opening up a Rondecoy Mall in 1990 and uh, those two those two properties you know sucked some of your primary trade area away from us uh shrunk the shrunk the trade area for us a little bit and i think the company realized that uh, with the growth that was starting to develop on the east side of town and in the eastern suburbs uh, it was time and, and you know a lot of the qualitative Demographics: the the education, the um, household incomes, uh, you know, some of those uh, above and beyond just the population uh, were were very good, and uh, they were able to uh, to work very hard to uh, secure the uh, secure the uh, department stores of Lord and Taylor and J C Penney. Now, at the time, Lord & Taylor, certainly one of the most upscale stores uh, in the nation, department stores, and there's a little bit of a, of a Pied Piper effect you have with uh, department stores and with retailers. So the, uh, the announcement and, and the uh, entry of Lord & Taylor into the market was, was terrific for us, and it really helped us attract some tenants that otherwise were uh, hesitant to come into the Rochester market. You know, we were finding the studies were showing that the shoppers were looking for, you know, some more upscale offerings and that they were going out of the market uh, to, to find them. They were going to, to Buffalo, they were going to Syracuse, they were going to New York City or, you know, whatever their choice was to, uh, uh, to do some shopping, some more upscale shopping. So, um, so we did this expansion. And uh, we, we provided some additional upscale, uh, upscale offerings. We added an additional 60 stores. And if I recall correctly, I think 32 or 33 of those stores were stores that were unique to Eastview in the market. So now you're creating a center that's able to draw from, 
further distance away, uh, people that will travel. And uh, they're not, you know, they're not just coming from the neighborhood or they're not just coming from 10 miles away. Now they're starting to come from maybe 20 miles away, coming from 25 miles away. So you're expanding your trade area uh, by, by adding you know, the Lord and Taylors and, and some of these other stores that, uh, that we welcomed. You know, we were, at that time we added, you know, Ann Taylor, Abercrombie and Fitch, uh, Charter Club, Cache, some, some really nice uh, retail fashion tenants and it made a really nice difference for us. At that time, we also added a 750-seat food court with a carousel, um, as you can see in that photo, which has always been very popular with the kids. And uh, we replaced the carpet with a tile, as I mentioned a little while ago. Still some green in there. And a uh, few years after that, we welcomed Regal Cinema and Funscape. And uh, if those of you remember Funscape, it was an indoor amusement facility. It was part of the Regal chain. They, 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 uh, they decided they want, wanted to kind of try this new concept. And I think they opened up six of the Funscapes. And it didn't go so well for them. Um, they, they, you know, for a family of four, family of four was, at that time was probably going to be paying 100 bucks or so to, to come and spend a few hours. And I think, you know, they found that People would come once or twice a year, but they weren't coming once or twice a month. And uh, um, they, the markets they were in just were not that conducive to uh, you know, a tremendous tourism or tourist uh, uh, clientele. So uh, it did not work for them. In fact, I, we were either the last one to close or the second to last uh, to close the Funscape. And, uh, Regal still obviously sits there, and, and it's a very, very good theater for them. But, uh, but Funscape, unfortunately, didn't work out so well. So, you know, one thing I also wanted to add that really wasn't part of the expansion, but came in the early 2000s, and this was after 9-11. Uh, and it's something that's really made a difference for us, even to this day. Uh, Sheriff Pavro had, had approached me about uh, some community policing grants that were available in, I, I guess, the nation um, as a result of 9-11 of and, you know, the, the desire to create a, you know, safer community. And uh, he had come to me and, and, and asked if we would be interested in, in getting involved in this grant program, which would provide one deputy at the mall, one full-time deputy at the mall, um, Full time, and uh, the cost would basically basically be split between the mall and this grant money, and uh, for us certainly it seemed like kind of a no brainer, and I think it was a no brainer. Uh, so we we signed on, and and I think for a few years afterwards, you know, some of these grants still kind of came up as opportunities, and of course we said yes, and uh, over time it's developed into even more than that. Uh, you know, at this point in time, we have three full-time deputies that work at the mall. They have an office in the mall. Uh, the mall picks up, a, I would say, a good portion of, of the salary. But I can tell you this, it's well worth it. You know, in today's days, day and age, you know, there's obviously a you know, focus on, on security, and that has continued to grow over the years with probably shopping centers and any other type of public facility. But um, you know, we have found it to be a tremendous benefit to us to have these deputies here. And I can tell you they have all been, we've had several, you know, some of them kind of cycle through, they get promoted. They really are tremendous. The deputies that we have had care. Um, they, uh, they assist shoppers any way they can. Uh, they're very professional. So I, I give Sheriff Pavro a tremendous amount of credit and, and try to thank him as often as I can for uh, for all he's done to help them all. I mean, he, he's just been a great ally for us and that has made a difference in the, uh, the trajectory of, of them all. So I'll get a little plug in there for the sheriff's office. They were great. All right, in 2003, um, a couple things happened. A lot of the studies we were doing showed that there was an interest or desire, I should say, on the part of our shoppers for more food options. 
Um, and there were also, just in studies we had done, shown, and something we already knew, was that there wasn't a lot of curb appeal to the mall. If you remember, there were some columns at the front entrance. It wasn't all that attractive on the outside. Once you got inside, it, it was very nice, but the, but the outside was, was pretty plain looking. Um, so we, uh, we did this. We, uh, we added this front courtyard. Uh, we added uh, three restaurants, Biagi's Champs, P.F. Chang's, uh, because it showed there was a need for them. At, uh, at this point in time, um, you know, we still have two of those restaurants here. We still have Champs. We still have P.F. Chang's. Biagi's was here for about 15 years. They left. Um, they, they initially wanted to create, they're, they're based out of Illinois. They had wanted to create a region, a northeast region, because one of their owners was from the Ithaca area or maybe went to college in Ithaca, wanted to create a, uh, a Biagi's kind of chain, regional chain. Didn't happen. They kind of continued to hang on. It was a good restaurant for them. They didn't want to kind of let go, but it got to the point where they just said, look, it, it, just, it just makes sense. We, we got to go. Uh, so they left. Um, we, for, we had a short-lived tenant, um, a steakhouse called Prime, which does very well in Syracuse, but just was not able to really get any good legs here. So they were, they were here for a year, between a year and two years. Uh, they closed, and uh, next week we have a new restaurant opening up in that location that we're really excited about. It's called Nicino, and uh, it's uh, an Italian restaurant. I would say there will be a lot of similarities to, to Biagi's and certainly some differences. Uh, but it is being uh, started up and, and operated by a local operator named Josh Miles, along with his, uh, with his chef. And uh, Josh right now, he, he operates the Revelry downtown, Branca downtown, Bitter Honey, which is down at the public market new restaurant called Velvet Belly, which I understand is very good, but I, you know, have not been there. So he's a really well-known local restaurateur, and, uh, you know, he's, he's really excited about the opportunities here, and uh, they've remodeled, you know, the restaurant. It, uh, it looks really nice. I wish I could show you some photos, but, uh, but I, I, I did not. Uh, but they're planning to open up this month, and uh, we, we can't wait to welcome them. Uh, return of the sundial. I mentioned our big sundial came down uh, back a while back, and uh, we I think we worked with one of the school groups from Victor High School to help us do you know a science related group that helped us kind of place the sundial in the the, the right location, so it was telling the right time. Um, so uh, I don't remember that club's name. It's been a while, but uh, they they were helpful, and it was kind of a school project for them. Um, and it does tell the right time. And then uh, following that, um, you know, we had L.O. Bean opened in 2010. Great opening for us. They've been a great tenant for us. Uh, and then a few years after that, Bonton, who I didn't mention earlier, but Bonton operated in that McCurdy's uh, location. I think, I think they opened in 95 and closed maybe in 2011. Those numbers might not be correct, but they're pretty close. And then Velmar, uh, which is an Iowa-based department store, family-owned department store, one of the very few uh, family-owned department stores left, uh, came in and, and opened up in that location. And they have been a, a tremendous, tremendous addition for us. Um, very unique. You know, I mentioned that ability to draw from, from a ways away. I mean, they, they draw very nicely from Syracuse and from Buffalo. Um, our Canadian shopper, while it's kind of been shut down for the last couple of years, um, is, uh, is very good. Most of the Canadian shoppers still s do their shopping in Buffalo. Um, we wish they would come a little further east. They, some do. Um, but, uh, but outside of this market, you know, it's, it's, we have some really good secondary markets that support them all. And then along with the Von Maher opening in 2013, we remodeled that wing of the mall as well. Um, and there we go, Eastview today. Um, 
That is our seating area by, by the Von Maur store. Um, we opened up probably one of the biggest openings, or probably the biggest opening we've had since Von Maur, um, is the new Dick's House of Sports store that took place in, uh, that's in the uh, former Sears location. Uh, it's their first store of this particular concept. It's been tremendously successful. You know, they wanted to, uh, to create an experiential store. They wanted, you know, where, where people could come in and try stuff. Um, they have golf simulators, they have bathing cages, they have a climbing wall, they have a big outdoor field that is kind of open for parents and kids to come and kick a soccer ball around. And uh, I was talking to the manager not that long ago, and he said, you know, he says, sure, a parent probably goes in their backyard once in a while and kicks a ball around with their kid, but it's kind of a special event maybe to come to the store on the turf field. It has kind of a professional feel to it, and you can, you know, just have fun with your kids. And they're trying to create this, and have done a very nice job of creating this really nice family atmosphere with a lot of the things they do. Uh, next Wednesday, I think the 17th, um, they're going to be filling in the, that grass field with ice, uh, with water, uh, with a chiller and compressor, and they're going to create a community skating rink. So you're going to be able to come and skate. Uh, parents can come with their kids. You're going to be able to rent skates if you want. It's, uh, it's going to be, it's a tremendous idea, and it's going to, it's going to run, I think, November through maybe March, February or March. And uh, it's an incredibly expensive proposition to, to do this. But they are uh, they're using this as kind of a test because it's their first one. Um, but they're seeing such success with a lot of the things they're trying. And they're, and they're very, uh, very confident that this ice skating rink is going to be a real hit in the community. I mean, it, 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 it's, a, it's a wonderful tenant that we've welcomed to the mall. Um, there's probably no better experiential tenant out there um, than, than this particular one, Dick's House of Sports, uh, just a fantastic store. They came in, you know, they just partnered up this week for an event this week with Nike. Um, and uh, some type of Nike partnership, some type of, you know, frequent shopper thing. And uh, they actually built a, a basketball court basketball court next to the field and it, for a three-day event I mean I can't imagine what this cost uh, it's an indoor court and uh, they have some Syracuse alumni coming in to help coach kids they had you know the Met, New York Mets catcher this morning doing some drills with kids they have uh, uh, one of the or a couple of the Olympic female Olympic softball players in today I think tomorrow they have a Paralympian gold medalist basketball uh, player who's going to be playing with the uh, the local, I think they're called the Rochester Wheels. That's the local wheelchair basketball team. So, um, you know, the Nike CEO actually was, was in for this today, which uh, which was pretty uh, pretty neat. And I, from what I understand, some of the people from, uh, they were coming from out of town, asked uh, what they should wear. So... Uh, I'm not sure what they were expecting the answer to be, but uh, I assume it had to do with weather, but I'm not entirely sure. Um, but, but obviously, it was very nice that they, uh, you know, that they, they came in and, and helped celebrate. Uh, um, you know, when the Nike CEO comes in, it, it, it means that it, it, it's important to him and to them. Uh, so yeah, we have about 160 stores right now. Um, you know, it's, uh, you know, we have, you know, I noted some current industry trends and issues. Um, well, certainly one, it's kind of current, it's kind of been going on for a while, is online shopping, you know, um, that has certainly had an impact uh, on, on brick and mortar retail. But what we're seeing is the successful tenants now and going forward in the future, they're doing both. They're, you know, they have brick and mortar stores, they have an effective online um, presence, and they're able to marry those. You know, it's, uh, you can order online and pick up in store. 
You can go into the store. If they don't have it, they'll order it for you, and they'll have it shipped to your home. Uh, if you bought something online and you don't like it, well, you can return it to the store. And, and these retailers know if they return it to the store, odds are they're going to buy something else. So, you know, not that long ago, you know, the, these, the two divisions, you know, they're online and they're brick and mortar, kind of operated parallel. And I used to hear a lot of complaints, you know, from, from store managers saying, oh my gosh, you know, there um, are our, our online people, there's an online sale for this purse for 100 bucks and we sell it for 150 and they come in, they, they expect to get it for 100 and my company's not allowing me to do it. So they, they've kind of worked through those kinks over the years. So, you know, they've, they've meshed them very well. So I think you're going to see, again, the successful tenants will continue um, and be able to, to even do a better job of, of meshing uh, both their online and retail uh, uh, brick and mortar presence. Uh, social media, you know, Bob and I were just talking a little bit about social media earlier and, you know, the pros and cons of it. Um, I think from a positive standpoint, obviously we can advertise, we can hit our shoppers pretty, pretty effectively and pretty inexpensively uh, online. Um, Facebook and Instagram, that type of thing. Uh, and it works very well for us. Um, negative side, well, you know, people like to offer up their opinions and, you know, if they, you know, if they have a bad experience, they'll be very quick to, uh, to make that known as well. So you have to kind of be on top of that and you have to, uh, to be paying, you know, close attention and be able to, to respond to people who had a bad experience and who are posting it on Facebook or Instagram or whatever it may be. I was talking to a, uh, uh, some of our staff, I don't know, not, not that long ago, about something that came up. It's, a, it's a, kind of a story that I still laugh about all these years later. Um, and, and compare it then versus if social media was, was in existence now. This was probably the early 90s, I'm going to say 93, 94. And we were doing trick-or-treating in the mall, store to store. At our customer service center, we were giving away Lion King posters. And about midway through uh, the event, um, one of our security officers, you know, radios me and says, Mike, you know, we got a problem. You got to come down to customer service. So I said, okay. So I went down, and then there was a woman with her young son, and you could tell she was really, really uh, upset. She was not happy. And I, you know, I asked her what was wrong, and, and she just proceeded to tell me how she cannot believe that we were giving these posters out to kids. And I, I said, I'm not sure what you're talking about. I mean, you know, we're giving Lion King posters out. You know, I, I'm not sure why you're so upset. Well, you know, she opened up the poster, and it was like this, it was a, it was a college dorm poster of like this half-naked young lady with, you know, and I still remember looking at it with the, the line that said, if at first you don't succeed, buy her another beer. Well, you know, <laughs> it was not good. I, you know what, I couldn't give this woman enough things that night. Uh, you know, she, she got more candy, or her, her boy got more candy, and I'm thinking, oh my God, you know, thank, you know, I, thank God I got through that, and then it hit me, I said, oh my gosh, how many of these are out there? You know, I mean, was there a big box of these that went out? And, and you know, you talk about sleepless nights. That was another one. I'm thinking, what am I going to wake up to tomorrow morning? You know, how many of these posters were given out? Uh, you know, and we're thinking they're Lion King posters. And that was the only call I got. So the, somehow this one poster, an appropriate poster, ended up uh, in the hands of this uh, probably seven-year-old boy so we were uh, I don't dodge another bullet I guess I don't know so but uh, but yeah but but kind of getting back to what I, what I mentioned you know we were talking about social media if that happened today there you know there were probably ten people maybe around watching what was going on well five or six of those people would have had their cameras out and they would have sent it to their friends or sent it to the media or whomever you know it, it certainly would have spread to a certain level way, way more than, than it did that evening when we were able to kind of take care of it at, uh, 
you know, at that moment. So, uh, so there are pros and cons to social media. There's a lot of good, but you know, you just have to be aware that uh, of uh, of some of the negatives that can come along with it. And uh, you know, certainly the current issue is uh, is the pandemic or the most current issue. Uh, 2020 was not a good year. Uh, not surprisingly, we were closed for about three months, March 18th to July 27th. Well, March. April, May, June, July, about four months. Um, and uh, most tenants, obviously, were not particularly happy about that and came to us looking you know, for some, some type of help, which we, we really reached out and did everything we could for them. We understood their pain. You know, we obviously have some operating costs as well, so you know, everything's not a freebie, but, but we were able to work with most to keep them in. We lost about 12 stores last year, which is about six more than we normally do. Normally we'll lose, you know, six for, you know, lease expirations and either we or they don't want to renew or bankruptcies or whatever it may be. So um, we're starting to to build back up. We've added about six stores this year, so we're kind of working our way back, which is good. Um, sales this year have been tremendous, and I'm not saying tremendous versus 2020. We're, you know, that that year doesn't even exist in, in a lot of the ways we look at things. We look at 2019, we compare to 19. Sales are up in double, double digits over 2019. And uh, when we kind of look at it and try to figure what is it, what, you know, certainly the stimulus money that was out there, you know, for better or worse, the pros and cons, people were out there spending it, so it worked out well for our retailers. Um, I think you know, the stock market's pretty, been pretty good. I think you know those people that have money invested uh, feel, have felt pretty good about the way that that has gone. Um, our Dick store has been a great addition to the mall and brought a lot of people in that otherwise wouldn't be uh, wouldn't be coming. So um, I guess you know you kind of combine. You look at those three things. I mean, but we're not just. It's not just us. I mean, nationally, brick and mortar retail has been very good. And I remember last year, a lot of people saying to me, boy, I bet, you know, with these people sitting at home, they're going to learn how easy it is to buy online and, and, and buy things online. I bet you that's really going to impact your business. And my response even at the time was, you know what, I don't think so. I think people are going to realize they don't want to sit around at their house at their computer all day. I mean, people want to be social. They want to, whether it's going to the mall or going to the local plaza or going out to eat or going to the movies, people want to be active and they want to be out. They don't want to be sitting in their chair all day uh, in front of a computer. And I think certainly some of it, um, uh, some of the reason for our success this year is just that. You know, people are coming out, they want to see their friends or their family and, and uh, do some shopping. Um, you know, with, with a talk, all this talk about inventory issues and, and, and cargo ships sitting at the port and is there going to be enough inventory, it kind of kind of plays into our hands, I think. You know, we can, we can tell people, look, you know, you can come to the mall and you can walk away and hop in your car with that product. Um, if you order it online, there's certainly more of a possibility. It's not going to get to you by Christmas time. Um, so we don't know how much of an issue that's going to be, you know, uh, inventory levels, um, but, uh, but it could be. I think it will be to some extent. I don't know if it'll be very minor or if it'll be significant, but I think it will be there. And I think, you know, there are some advantages that we have, you know, having that uh, um, brick and mortar presence, I guess, so to speak. So. Um, Questions, um, and then before I question, there's a, a couple of thanks I, I, I do want to give, and I, I just wrote them down here. Um, the town of Victor and, and Ontario County, all their departments have in so many ways been supportive of the mall, supportive of me, um, supporting of our people, our company. So we really appreciate that. Uh, it's been a really good relationship that we've had with, with the town and with the county. Uh, I mentioned Sheriff Pavro in the Ontario County Sheriff's Office. What a, what a great group of people they are, professional and, and always helpful. The Fishers Fire District, you know, the, those, 
that group of, uh, of people have, have always been there for us to keep us safe. We appreciate that. And I guess last, the community. You know, all of you come out shopping and maybe say a nice word about us now and then, because that certainly makes a difference. Um, you like to, you know, try to keep a good positive relationship and relations in the community. And, and uh, we appreciate everything that everybody in this community does for us. So. With that said, I don't know if anyone has any questions. Um, fire away. If not, uh, I'll be kicking around for a little while. Yes? So, for Route 96, does that have to be altered at all to um, build the mall? I, I don't believe so. I don't believe so. If we go back, we'll go back to the, let's go right there. I believe that's the original 96 that kind of curves around. I don't think there were any changes, to my knowledge. Uh, any, any. It looks Yes, I, I, I believe it is. I believe it is. You know, back the the mall I was at in Schenectady, I recall we had to kind of relocate a little stream, you know, um, because this little it's called the called the Poetic Kill. And it flowed right through the property, so we were required by the DEC to, to uh, kind of work around it. And this is completely off topic, but at that same property, I can recall the first time before I, I went out to the property, I was looking at our lease plan, and by, right by one of our entrances, it, it said cemetery. So I, I, I asked our construction manager, I said, you know, what's, the, what's you know, this thing that says cemetery? He said, well, it's a cemetery. And uh, when they were doing the, uh, the site work for it, for the property, um, clearing it out, they came across a family cemetery uh, for some of the earliest settlers of Schenectady, a Dutch family called the Vedder family, V-E-D-D-E-R. And uh, of course, there was some concern, what do we do? And I know they reached out and they were able to reach some of the, the descendants of the Vedder family. Um, and they were they were completely fine with it. We we worked the cemetery around one of the mall entrances. The Vetter family would come and on occasion and visit. And their their take on it was, look, if you guys didn't do this work, we would never know it existed. So they had a, a good attitude about it. So we we were appreciative of that. And uh, I was in Schenectady for the last three four months, and uh, the cemetery is still sitting there. I guess as you would hope it would be. So. Yes, sir. Uh, one of the stores I missed, of course, was the Sears store, mm -hmm. which had the garage of service area. Yes. What, what are the possibilities of getting something like that in that area there where you can have a car service while you're shopping? Auto center, you, you know, well, that, that parcel is actually still owned by a uh, kind of the real estate arm of Sears. We don't own that Dick's building. We didn't own the Sears. That was owned by Sears. Sears branched off and created like a real estate arm, I want to say 10 years ago, called Seritage. And so they, they became kind of the landlord. And uh, they are still the landlord of that, that property. They're the landlord for Dick's and they're the landlord for the old auto center. So it's completely their decision what they do with it. I think, I believe that they have approached some, uh, some people and companies in that business. Um, but obviously at this point in time, there's been no talk of anything happening. Uh, we would, uh, you know, we'd like to, I know B BJ's had done, I think some work for a while. I think they've scaled back. I'm not sure where they actually are now. I think they do tires and I think it's pretty limited what they do. But, uh, but yeah, we could, we could use that. I mean, there's a lot of uses that, that that we could, we'd still like to have that we don't have over there right now. Oh. Yes, ma'am. It's another issue. They they own uh, they own the building. Okay. They do they do. So we're not quite sure the uh, you know the the future uh, of them. So it's owned by Hudson Bay, which is the uh, uh, um, the umbrella company for L and T. So yeah, still sits there, unfortunately. So, yes, that's fine. I saw some uh, online chatter about uh, the walkers in the morning. Yes. Mm -hmm. were no longer allowed to come in before Yeah, yeah, that's a tough one. Um, it really came down to manpower. I mean, we, we, I guess, like a lot of companies out there, are struggling with manpower. 
And in order to open up our doors, we have to have a certain amount of, you know, security, maintenance, housekeeping in the mall. Uh, so there's been a struggle with, you know, from a manpower standpoint that kind of put us in a position where we said, look, we need to make sure that we're adequately covered when the tenants are open for business. And, uh, you know, yeah, I had heard from some, some walkers, and I know they weren't particularly happy about it, and I felt bad about it. But it's kind of a decision we had to make just based on some manpower availability that we had. Possibly, I don't know. We're gonna, we're just gonna have to kind of wait and see and see how things develop. So I don't know is probably the only answer I can yeah, give you on that. I know, I know. Yes, no, absolutely. It's, uh, it was, yeah, <laughs> yeah, it was tough. We, uh, you know, our other properties um, never returned to an earlier opening. They, they just stayed with the, the mall opening, and for the last like year, whatever year plus, we had we. We opened earlier because we felt we could, but we just got to the point where it didn't, uh, didn't make sense for us, or we couldn't do it, couldn't justify it. So. Well, I'd like to thank everyone for coming out. When Bob, yes, sir. I saw online hmm? that uh, some of the malls are paying $350 an hour for Santa Claus. Did you bring in, did you bring in the application? <laughs> <laughs> You know, I, I, I can direct you to the right person, but I do know we're not paying three hundred fifty dollars for our Santa for our Santas. Yeah, yeah, we, we've yeah, we've we, we we've got some great Santas, uh, but uh, but they're you know they're not quite paid that much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, of course. Yeah, yeah. That's right. That's right. So. Uh, yeah, yeah, when Bob asked me to speak, I thought it might be he, I, and, uh, you know, a couple of people that were coming in out of the cold, but I appreciate you all coming. That's, that's awesome. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thanks. Thanks. And, and thanks to all of you for coming. And for me, it's always a pleasure. I always learn so much, and it was great having Mike here and going through and remembering Eastview Mall over the years. So thanks, Mike.